Good morning, Stone Village, and happy Sunday. I hope that all of you are well and safe in this world. All is well in my world. The Lord be with you, and let us pray. Eternal and loving God, at Jesus' baptism, you spoke blessing. As your spirit hovers over the waters of our recreation, speak your word to us, so we may be born again of your grace, shaped by your love, and sent to serve in the gracious power of your spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The reading today is from Luke chapter 3, verses 15 through 17, 21 to 22. As the people were filled with expectation, and all were questioning in their hearts concerning John, whether he might be the Messiah, John answered all of them by saying, I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I is coming. I am not worthy to untie the thong of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into his granary. But the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. Now, when all the people were baptized, and when Jesus also had been baptized and was praying, the heaven was opened, and the Holy Spirit descended upon him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, the Beloved. With you I am well pleased. Jesus was about 30 years old when he began his work. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. For the most part, I love the liturgical rhythm of the church. Yet I admit I find the transition from Christmas to Epiphany a bit rushed, jarring, unsettling. One moment we're hanging out with Mary, gazing at a baby. The next moment we have jumped years in the future and witnessed the arrival of the gift-bearing Magi followed by a young family fleeing to Egypt. And then another time jump. We witness a 12-year-old boy in a temple, causing his parents a bit of panic. And then, and then, we're standing in a long line of people by the banks of the Jordan River. Ahead of us, waist deep in the water, John the Baptist proclaims, a no-nonsense call to repentance. Behind us, at the very end of the long line, stands the manger baby, all grown up. Thirty years have gone by, and the promised child is about to come into his promise. On the other hand, even though the whizzing between seasons feels jarring to me, I am grateful the first glimpse we have of Jesus' adult life is at his baptism. I'm especially grateful this year because the baptism story recorded in the Gospels speaks to a question, which I believe we all need to be asking in these difficult and divisive times. And the question is, how can we live well together? How can we belong well together? What must we do to embrace a truly common life as human beings coexisting on this chaotic and struggling planet? The word epiphany comes from the Greek meaning appearing or revealing. During this brief liturgical season between Christmas and Lent, we are invited to leave miraculous births and angel choirs behind and seek the love, majesty, and power of God in seemingly mundane things, rivers, voices, doves, clouds. And in the gospel stories, we read during this season of Epiphany, God parts the curtain for brief moments 
allowing us to look beneath and beyond the ordinary surfaces of our lives and catch glimpses of the extraordinary, which is perhaps another way of describing the sacrament of baptism, in which the extraordinary of God's grace blesses the ordinary waters we stand in. Whatever else Jesus' baptism story is, it is first and foremost a story of the sacred ordinary and profound humility. The holy promised child, conceived of the Holy Spirit, celebrated by angels, worshipped by shepherds, and feared by Herod, stands in the same muddy waters we stand in each day of our lives. And so Jesus' first public act is a declaration of solidarity. God is one of us. Now, in case we are tempted to skip over this aspect of the story too quickly, it's worth noting Jesus' baptism has raised many awkward questions ever since it happened over 2,000 years ago. According to some Christian theologians, Jesus' baptism was, is, an acute embarrassment for the early church because it didn't fit the divine image the church hoped to portray of Jesus. Why would the Son of God place himself under the tutelage of a locust-eating, communal anarchist like John the Baptist? Why would a supposedly unblemished and perfect Messiah need a baptism of repentance? Did Jesus really wish to align himself with the folks who journeyed into the wilderness to listen to John? Weren't those the same people who John called a brood of vipers? Weren't they desperate, broken, tainted, and sinful? Why would God, why would God choose such an odd moment in Jesus' life? Such a mundane and perhaps even sordid moment to part the clouds and call Jesus the Beloved. Why indeed? Unbelievable as it may seem, Jesus' first public act is an act of oneness, of radical and humble joining. His first step is a step towards us, you and me. Let it be so, Jesus says to John in Matthew's version of today's story, echoing the radical consent of his mother Mary. Let it be so, at the hands of another, he decides, indicating his power lies in his capacity to surrender, to share, to submit. Let it be so here, he further decides, in the muddy waters of the Jordan River. In this one moment, in this one act, Jesus steps into the common and inescapable experience of living in a broken, fragile world. A world hungering for redemption and restoration. The question at stake, I believe, is not about Jesus' personal sinfulness. The question is about what it means to declare genuine and costly solidarity with our neighbors in the world. In the world which is structurally, emotionally, and spiritually broken. Can we belong well to one another if we are unwilling 
to stand where the broken stand? Can we live as one if we are busy categorizing humanity between sin and sinless, saint and sinner, saved and damned? Can we follow Jesus if we are unwilling to stand where he stood in the muddy waters? Our Christian ancestors didn't know what to make of a God who would taint God's self by association. They couldn't understand Jesus' willingness to risk defilement by identifying himself with our messiness, our chaos, our weakness. They wanted to keep their God separate, safe, and squeaky clean. What about you? Do you need God to be squeaky clean? Or is mud acceptable? To embrace Jesus' baptism story is to embrace a core truth, which is we are all united, interdependent, connected, one. We do not live well without one another, and we are responsible for one another. Ours is to be a life of radical solidarity, not radical separateness. And so in this moment of muddy water and surrender to a locust eating evangelist, <laughs> we are encouraged to reach out, embrace, and love one another, and understand in the core of ourselves. We are beloved, not because we've done anything to earn it, but because God's very nature and desire is to love, and to birth the same kind of love within each of us. Understand baptism is all about stepping in, be it in the water or standing on dry land. It's all about finding the holy in the course of our ordinary, mundane lives within the family of God, which means we must choose epiphany, even and especially when we find it jarring and unsettling. We must choose it and then practice it. And the challenge is always before us. Look again, look harder, see freshly, stand in the place which looks utterly ordinary. And regardless of how scared or cynical you feel, cling to the possibility of a divine encounter. Listen to the ordinary and know it is infused with divine mystery. Stand in the muddy water with the people you'd rather not stand next to, skin to skin, fates knitted together. Because holiness, holiness, is in the spaces we create together. The season of Epiphany is deep water. You can't simply dip your toe in. You must take a deep breath and plunge. Yes, baptism promises new life, but it also drowns before it resurrects. Which I realize may lead you to wonder, what reason is there for hope then? Simply this, Jesus is the one who stands in line with us at the muddy water's edge, willing to immerse himself in shame, in scandal, in repentance, and in pain. So all of us might hear the only voice who can tell us who we are and whose we are. So listen. We are God's chosen, God's children, God's own. Even in the deepest, darkest water, we are the beloved. And so is our neighbor, and our neighbor's neighbor, and so on. We are all the beloved. We are one. May we live as one. Thanks be to God. Amen. I hope you have a great day, stoners. I'll talk to you soon. Bye.